Mm. Honorable Will stand together tonight. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Welcome, Welcome. children of God. Welcome, everybody watching online. Yes. It says in Psalms 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and everything that's in me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and don't forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, and crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Amen. Father, tonight we just thank you, God, for your loving kindness, your mercies. God, it's so easy to forget how good you are to us. Lord, it's so easy to look at everything else. We just pray tonight that through the worship, through the word, this time together, our eyes will be focused back on who you are, Father Thank God. You, on your goodness, on your mercies, on your forgiveness. May you heal those that are hurting tonight. May you heal those that are sick, God. May your Holy Spirit be here tonight in everything that we do. And we invite you in Jesus' Amen. name and all God's people pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
May your grace just be with us tonight, Lord. Everyone at home, Lord, that's watching, may you just bless them with your presence and your peace. And may uh, you just be on Pastor Mike tonight as he shares your word, God, and our hearts and minds will be open. We ask and we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why don't you turn to somebody, wave them, let them know you're glad they're here. So we have a few announcements. Um, we're continuing VBS, tomorrow virtual VBS, Adventure VBS. Has anybody been watching it? Yes. <laughs> At work, they're like, why are you laughing so much? Don't <laughs> be taking care of this big mom. <laughs> like, this is so funny. Yeah. And it's so good. You guys really did an awesome job, um, especially Jackie and Nina. You guys just did a really fantastic job, as well as everybody else that's involved. You guys are just amazing, all the young people and young adults and everything. And so um, it's just really good. It's really good. All the teachers, we got one right here, right here. Um, Brother Al did a great job. And then, um, well, the other guys aren't here tonight, but they did a great job too. So continue watching tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, day 4. And then Friday will be day 5. And hopefully you're enjoying your adventure packs. Um, kids at home watching, hopefully you guys are using those. And, you know, so have fun and get your parents involved. Um, uh, more on a somber note, we want to... Uh, Keep Pastor Ray's family involved, Sister Nina and Gonzalez, his older sister, passed away recently. So we just want to pray that the Lord will comfort them. And as well as Sister Dolly, Brother Frank, uh, memorial service tomorrow, 1 o'clock at Bellevue, the cemetery. So it's open to you know, us to go and the out outdoor part. So we'll keep them in prayer. We'll continue keeping brethren that aren't feeling well in prayer too. And um, Sunday morning service, Lord willing, will be here at 930. So, Pastor Mike, why don't you come up and I'll pray for those needs also. Father, we pray for the Gonzalez family tonight that you would comfort them. Lord, that you would minister to their heart and their hurting. Lord, just pray that you would be with them tonight, Lord. Thank you for the blessing they've been to all of us, and may, may they just know tonight we're thinking about them. We pray again for the Zamora family, Lord, that you would minister to Sister Dolly and her family and help them for the service tomorrow. And we just pray, Lord, that you would use it to, Lord, just um, bring people to you, Lord. We just pray for them. Also, continue using the VBS. Pray that the kids and young people would be encouraged, Lord, and that we would learn a lot about trusting in you and confidence in, in Christ. And we pray for Pastor Mike tonight as he shares the word that your grace will be on you. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. feel bad taking this off. There it goes. <laughs> taking this off because everybody's still out there suffocating. But like I mentioned before, you can you can cheat and sneak a, a nostril or two out and get some oxygen. We don't want anybody tipping over, passing out. <laughs> the Lord is good, amen. Praise God. Um, tonight we're going to continue in the book of James. We know that we've been going through on Wednesday night the, uh, the book of James. We began uh, a few weeks back, actually quite a few weeks back with this uh, shutdown kind of came into place and we, we began to go through the book of James. But now we're in chapter four tonight. So that's where we're going to begin. I wanted to share something I hope, uh, I hope sister doesn't mind, but it really blessed me and encouraged my heart. Um, sister Emma has shared with me. Uh, before service that uh, my brother Johnny the last time he was upstairs had shared with her um, with a heavy heart that uh, who was going to continue the work and who was going to continue to sing his song and I had never known any of this God had just placed it in my heart young Devin didn't have a clue so his eyes got this big when I called him forward on Sunday morning but just to be able to, to stand with his grandson and do that Jesus in me loves you, which blessed so many of us for so many years. And it just, the words are so powerful and true, but it was because the heart was so full that shared it. He, he, he had the ability to play a coffee stirrer and bring you to tears. 
<laughs> Brother Johnny was just a, a tremendous man. Uh, the very first time I shared the word of God from the pulpit was in the old church. Jeez, it 20 some years ago. I don't even remember exactly. And I just remember sharing the word of God and glancing over and seeing him stand to the side and a flash went off and my eyes went blank and I looked down I couldn't see my notes I didn't know what I was talking about <laughs> I was scared to death and got covered and I finished and afterward he came up to me and he said I took your picture I said yeah brother I noticed I couldn't see anything he said here it is and he showed me a picture of a donkey <laughs> that was just his personality it was I laughed it was hilarious <laughs> That was just that was just who Brother Johnny was, and he was just a tremendous, tremendous brother who brought joy to so many. So when you when you have a, an understanding of who our Brother Johnny, who our Brother Johnny is, and how he would just sing that song with all his heart, it was just a blessing. So I, I thank you for sharing that with me, sister. That was that was beautiful. Um, before we begin in uh, James chapter four, I, I would just like to uh, remember uh, uh, Brother Daniel in prayer. I know that he goes in for. For a surgical procedure tomorrow and uh, I just want to uh, for us just to bow our heads and pray and just to, to remember that God would cover him and keep him thank you Lord Heavenly Father we just again lift up our brother Daniel to you Lord as Father you know all he's going through you know the things that come against him Father you Father you know this procedure that's planned Father for tomorrow Lord we just pray Lord that you would Father give him Father peace as he goes through this this, this, uh, this trial, Lord, as this physical affliction comes against him, but Father, you are greater than these things. Father, you have lifted him up, Father, from other situations and circumstances, and Father, you have continued to go before him, and we know that you will do the same, Father. We just pray your peace would be upon him, his wife, his family, Lord, and, and even tonight that they would just rest in you, Lord, and even tomorrow you would cover him, uh, allow the doctors to only do the possible, and Father, you do the impossible. You put all these things in your hands, and we just, with joyful hearts, Father, knowing, Lord, that you are a good God, we place our brother down in your hands again. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we ended last Wednesday in chapter 3. And these, these masks are not good for glasses or for a fat guy. <laughs> they make me sweat and my glasses steam up. I can't see anything. But we ended in James chapter 3. And James was talking about something very specific. He was talking about two types of wisdom. And if we remember last week as we went through those two types of wisdom, one of them was a worldly wisdom and one was a heavenly wisdom. Uh, the worldly wisdom was earthly meaning it only was regarding the things of this life. The Word of God says in chapter 3 that it was sensual, only regarding what is pleasing to this flesh or gratification. And it says it was demonic, inspired by the enemy, full of envy, self-seeking, confusion, and every evil thing. And in contrast, we see, we see the heavenly wisdom, which is in chapter 3 verse 17 it says but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy now the fruits of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace praise God and that's beautiful that these words were given as instruction for those who make peace. But that wasn't everybody. Some didn't make peace. And so as we continue in chapter 4, verse 1, it continues that James was sharing. And again, this is such practical teaching that he gives us through the book of James. Sometimes it's a little bit painful. It's so practical because it kind of hits us where we live. And, and we all fall short of the glory of God. This, this isn't uh, news to any of you or to myself. But when we start reading the scripture and it just plays out before our eyes, it gives us a tendency just to, just to ask God for forgiveness <laughs> and just to be thankful for all he's done. So we'll begin in verse 1 of chapter 4. 
And we, and we want to remember, this is written to the church. It wasn't written to a specific church. It's a general epistle, but it was written to the church in general. So we are the church, amen? So the word of God says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure, that war in your members? Verse 2, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own pleasure. Verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Praise God. Well, as we read through these scriptures, our heart might say, well, that's not about us. <laughs> I haven't killed anyone lately. I, have, I don't have those things in my heart. And we, we see that James truly is getting down to the brass tacks of things. Again, he's speaking to the church in general and how the church is, is responding. He asks the question in verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? The, the, the squabbling within within the church. And it's not just in this church or in the church. It's in the church in general. Because there's a worldwide church. The body of Christ is the church. Those who are believers, to, who are, have received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. See, who have an understanding and, and a, a solid Bible teaching who are growing in those things. These, these are the church. And this is a worldwide church that we're a part of. So it says, where do these things come from? Where you war and fight. And then he gives an exact, uh, uh, he points exactly at where they come from. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. So it says it comes from your desires for pleasure, from, from, from lust, from, from your carnal lust. Lust is uh, anger or, or animosity leading to hatred or conflict. In John chapter, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 21. The word of God says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Verse 22. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So the word of God is talking about, it says you murder and covet. But it's speaking in a manner of, it's not literally talking about murdering somebody. So when we see certain things in the word of God, we have to analyze it a little more and understand what it's talking about. It says, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, anger can be a, 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 
can be equivalent to murder in the eyes of God, is what he's saying. And these are, are words of Christ. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, in the same likeness. It says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So it's talking about hatred. Hatred is something that grows within us and is fed by the fires of hell. But how could this be the case? He's talking to the church. Nobody in the church hates, right? That's an impossibility. Have you ever heard anybody in the church say they're not speaking to someone? They don't have a relation. I don't speak to that person. I, I, I wrote them off. I wrote them out of my life. I have no part with them any longer. That is an earthly wisdom. That's not a heavenly wisdom. We as believers do not have the luxury to say, I no longer am going to think of that person as existing anymore. I wrote them out of my life. It doesn't say, the word of God doesn't say you have to be a doormat or, or continue to reach out to someone that doesn't want anything to do with you. But we, on our behalf, cannot hate someone else. We can't cut someone else out of our life and say, that's it. You've gone too far. Because the word of God says, how we judge, we will be judged. Have we gone too far? We have to be careful. That judgment will come back upon us. But it says that covet is something that you want that someone else has. Something that you see them and it draws you to. And, and you, in your flesh, start beginning to think, how can I get what they have? And it's not one like they have. It's like, like David and Bathsheba, who they have, what they have. So it says, you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain. You fight and you war. And, and this, what is this spirit? What is this wisdom coming from? Because he just spoke about the two types of wisdom. So everything that he's saying is pointing to this worldly wisdom. See, we have to remember that just because it's a different chapter, it doesn't mean it's a different word. It continues to flow. The, the, the chapters and verses were not put in place when the word of God was written. It was put in after so we would be able to follow it find things and be able to share it. So it's it's for our own understanding. And in some cases it is at different times, but we have to be able to read before it to understand if that's the case in this. So we know that he's, he's sharing with this same heart. It says, you do not have because you do not ask. How do we ask God for something? Through prayer. That's our communication with God, is through prayer. So what he's saying is, you're not praying. How can you get from God if you don't ask? If you don't pray and ask God? Because in certain cases, and this is what it's referring to, because it's not something of God that he's asking for. It says, we're trying to get things on our own. We're trying to get what we want in a manner that we can bring it to ourselves. It's not asking God for help. It's doing it on our own, of our own strength. So it's talking about different types of prayer. First, obviously, is no prayer. We say, well... Why, why not prayer? Why wouldn't we pray? Our thought might say, because God's just going to say no anyway. We can think of God as our Heavenly Father. Have you ever, as young people or children, and I'm not saying you're not young people anymore, but gone to your parents and thought of asking maybe your dad or your mom for something and thought, nah, I'm not going to ask. There's no way they're going to say yes to that. They're not going to get me a monkey or whatever crazy thing was in your mind as a kid. He said, no, I'm not going to ask for that. That can't happen. And some people might look to God and say the same thing. Say, God won't help me in this circumstance. I've got to fix it myself. I've got to make things right 
in whatever way I can do. Because our first response to things is how can we fix it? What can we do of ourselves with our hands to put things in a better situation? And then you always hear the, 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 the line of, you know what? We've done all we can. Now all we can do is pray. When it's the most opposite in the things of God. Because the first thing we're supposed to do is fall to our knees and pray. We have a God who is an all-powerful, all-knowing God who is above all things. And we have access to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. He calls us to seek his face. So first and foremost, we must pray. So it's saying, in this case, though you don't pray, so you don't get. And then it says in verse 3, and you ask, meaning you do pray, and you don't receive because you ask amiss. Because now it's talking about selfish prayer. You ask amiss, it says, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So that becomes this selfish prayer is just focused on this. And what's so scary sometimes is when our prayers focus on only what involves in this life. We start praying about finances. Well, we need finances. But God knows that. We start being overly concerned with, with certain situations or circumstances. And we start asking God to help us in it. And help us do this and help us do that. And we spent a half hour praying to God. And then we say, hey, yeah, oh, and bless that one brother that has that one problem. I don't remember what it was in there. But we have to be mindful of our prayers. Is there a lot of I and me in our prayers? Lord, help me. I need this. Can you give me, help me? We can really get an insight to our heart when we listen to our prayer. Because we're crying out to God. We're asking God. This is a communication. It's a two-way two communication. And if we are asking amiss only because we want to spend it on our pleasures, on our flesh, and what's going to bless us, then it's not a two-way communication. It's us reading the, uh, Santa, our, our Christmas list. And I want a new bike, and I want this, and I want this. Oh, yeah, and you know what? Maybe you could get something from them, too. You know, yeah, we'll throw someone else on our Christmas list once we're done you know, with all of our stuff. But it's talking about praying in the right manner. You know, there's another prayer as well, and it doesn't really get too much into that point in the scripture, but it's a false prayer. A false prayer is very similar to a selfish prayer, but a false prayer is praying for the sake of prayer. It sounds unusual, but what I'm saying is to be able to say you prayed about something. You know what? I'm seeking God. I want God's wisdom in this decision that I have before me. I'm trying to decide whether my car is falling apart enough and I'm going to get another car or if I'm going to put money into this car. And I'm asking God, what do you want me to do, God? What direction do you have me to go? And you'll pray that way and you'll say, but I want a new car. And you'll get up from prayer and you'll say, I prayed about it. Now I'm going to go get my new car. But God didn't answer anything. God didn't tell you anything. You were too consumed. You went in with a predetermined prayer. You said, I'm going to go and pray for my car and go get it. See, that's not prayer. That's not communication. If you had a discussion with someone else in that same manner and didn't let them speak and you asked their opinion, so what do you think I should do in this circumstance? And as soon as you stop talking, they start to open their mouth to answer. You go, okay, thanks, and you walked away. And that's what we do to God. We shut the door on God. God says, be still and know that I'm God. We pray, we sit, we wait, and we ask him to minister to us. See, we read his word because he can even give us understanding through his word. He places things in our heart. He gives us direction. He opens doors before us, and his thumbprint is peace. We know God's hand is upon it when he gives us his peace. It's not just our own thoughts. It's his peace. So many people will say, yeah, I prayed about that. I prayed about this. 
but it seems so contrary to what God's will is. Yeah, but I prayed, you know, and it's okay. Well, I'm going forward. So it's being mindful of what God is calling us to do. And remember, James is calling them out here. James is calling the people of God out. He's really, because he says, as, as they're praying, let me, let, me, let me take a step back here for a second. First of all, what is the purpose of prayer? We know it's communication with God. But when we pray, what do we desire to happen? And that's an honest question. We say, well, prayer is, is something that we want to communicate with God and gain understanding. But some people see prayer as a way to get God's arm behind his back and make him do what we want him to do. And you have people that will stand behind pulpits like this and say, all you have to do is pray for prosperity and you force the hand of God and he will bless you and he will give you finances and you will do it. And that is all a lie from the pit. Because there's nothing eternal involved in that. These things of the world are, we're told that he will provide all our needs. End of story. That's where the focus ends on all those things. See, God's not here to make everybody rich. But that's the lie of the enemy. And he's entering pulpits and he's putting false thoughts in people's minds and hearts. Well, we're supposed to be focusing on the eternal. He's got the, the gold ring that he's waving in front of people's faces. And they're saying, well, I want to follow after that because look at how blessed they are. I want to follow after that. The purpose for prayer is fellowship and communication with God so that we can come under His will. It's not to try to change God's will. It's not to try to tell God what He has to do in our life or in anyone else's life. But as we have a close communication with God, just like you have a close relationship with someone, you know their thoughts. If it's a, someone that you have a lot of trust and faith in, you know that their heart is good, and you know that they would try to help you in any way. How do you know that? Because you spent time with them. Because you know how they respond to things. See, as we spend time with God, we begin to understand His goodness even more. That's why as we get closer to the mirror, we see how much more work we need. When we use this mirror of the Word of God, and we get closer, we see how much we fall short. We need more of Him. We need more grace. And we need to know him more. And that's what prayer is. It's getting an understanding of God, of his will, and trying to align us with his will. And so many people think that prayer is trying to fix God and put God in line with what we want, what we're supposed to be praying, and getting in line with what God has for us. So that's the important part of prayer. So it continues and it says, and this is where he really kind of hits him with both barrels. Verse 4. It says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that fr uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Wow. Wow. What is being an adulterer? We know that it's stepping outside of marriage. I don't think I need to be any more graphic than that with someone that you're not married to. But what does it imply? There is a connection. There is a marriage. There is a promise that you have made. You know that we're called the bride of Christ? that the church is the bride of Christ? That we're gonna have a wedding supper of the Lamb? That we, we have been committed by our own doing, by stepping out, receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have been tied to Christ. We have been connected to Him. See, it, it, it speaks of in a few different scriptures. It says in Isaiah chapter 54, verse five, that for your maker is your husband, and the Lord is his name. 
It says it also in Jeremiah. It says it in Ezekiel quite a few times. It says it in Hosea. Uh, Hosea. It says it in Colossians chapter 3. But what James is saying here is not talking about physical. It's talking about spiritual. It's talking about spiritual adultery. Because again, the church is the bride of Christ. So what is spiritual adultery? It's being joined and committed to Jesus Christ and going back to the world for pleasure and for answers. That is, that is what it's talking about being adulterers or adulteresses. Being committed. We've received Jesus Christ. We have, have, have come under the grace and the blood and we know that we have gained eternity through this. And yet the world's still there calling us. And do we think as believers that we can continue to go back into the world and do the things of this world that they have pleasure in that causes this flesh to be drawn or even to look for answers and guidance or even weigh the advice of this world with the same authority that we weigh the word of God with? That is spiritual adultery. That is putting the things of this world at the same level as the things of God. I mean, think of it in a physical sense. How much damage that does in the heart of a man or a woman that's gone through this certain situation or circumstance. But to a God that gave everything that sacrificed his only begotten son and that we willfully said, we love you, Jesus. Come into my heart. I'm going to follow what you lead me. I'm going to go in the way you guide me. And then we think, ah, oh, we can do this or that. It's not that big a deal. That's what James is saying. The commitment must be there. We must see it at a level in the same way that 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 a marriage would see it in the flesh. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, Jesus said this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. No one can serve God or mammon, or money it's speaking of. But it's talking about the world system. We have a choice to follow the wisdom of the world or the wisdom that is a heavenly wisdom. Again, James is still pouring this same thing down. And he's talking about the commitment that we make to seeking God, to looking for Him in our times of trial. Look, look at it in the physical sense. And I don't want to go too much further into this. But to me, it, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks because it started making you think, okay, uh, uh, the world has done nothing but damage us. And that's, uh, that's the thing that's the X that's behind us. And we get married and all of a sudden we have a situation and we start going back and asking that X for advice. We start asking that X for guidance and that, that, that X has done nothing but drive us into the ground. How is that going to make our marriage relationship? And in no way am I comparing our, our Savior to, to us as humans. I'm just saying in general to get a concept of how far and how deep-rooted this can be. It's turning our back on the Savior. And we get advice from the world, from non-believers. But they're a really good friend. They're a nice person. They really know a lot. They're very smart but they're not saved. And we'll get their advice and we'll say, oh, that's good advice and maybe I should do this and I'm not sure. And the Bible says this, I know, but they told me that. How can we weigh him at the same, with the same authority? God says, you're my bride. Jesus says, you're my bride. Don't step anywhere else but towards me if you need anything. Seek me in prayer. Come to me in your times of trial and tribulation. Don't look around everywhere else and say at the last at the last ditch effort, I can't do anything else. Now I might as well pray. 
See, James continues and he says, verse 5, Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us, which is the Holy Spirit, yearns jealously. See, we serve a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4, chapter 4, verse 24 says, The Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. He loves his people. He wants to be there for us. And verse 6, James continues. He says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Praise God. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Is his grace a payment for our humbleness? Of course not. We can do nothing to earn that grace. But it puts us in a position to be able to receive it. Because we're open to it. We're, we're humbling ourselves. And we're open to receive that grace that God can give. But it says God resists the proud. You know that the, the, the resist the proud? The, the phrase, the translation of that phrase is sets himself in battle array against him. He resists the proud. God sets himself in battle array against the proud. The proud heart. That's how serious God sees it. But he gives grace to the humble who are willing. Who are willing to receive it. We have to be humble hearted. We have to understand how big a God we serve. And how small we really are. Because the next verse says, in verse 7, therefore submit to God. That's a, that's a word that is, a, I don't know, is it a, a multi, in Yahtzee would be a multi number or a, it would cause the bell to go up. When you say the word submit, people go, what? Especially if you add submit to your husband or submit to the church or submit because it's like you want me to give my authority to someone else you want me to come under someone else and our flesh is I'm not going to submit to anybody but that's where the difference is from the worldly and from the heavenly if someone is going to bless is good and desires to, to, to cover you and to bless you in any way they can. If you have a, wise, if you have a husband who you know loves you with all their heart, you know they would do anything for you. Why wouldn't you want to come under that? Because you know that they never desire bad for you. They're human. They're going to fall. Husband's the same likeness. It says submit one to another, even as brethren. Because we know we have a good heart that loves the Lord and we want to help each other. The word submit should not be something that is a taboo word that causes everyone to wake up, but the world does. But it says submit to God who is above all things. That should be an automatic. It says submit to God and resist the devil. So now we just change that. What does resist mean? It means to set ourselves in battle array against him. So we resist the devil. It's an active Resisting of the devil. People say, I don't believe in the devil. That's not real. That's just, uh, that's just tradition, or that's just uh, uh, what, you know, what the Bible says, but I don't believe that. It doesn't matter what we believe. Jesus said it. If he said it, it's true. If there is good, there has to be bad. But if we have an enemy that wants to attack us, wants to knock us down. And we're willing to ignore the fact that they exist. How much of an advantage do they have over us? We have to realize he is real. He is real. But we must resist him. And, what, and, what, and how are we doing that? We know Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 says, Put on the full armor of God, that we may be able to stand 
against him, against the wiles of the enemy. We're to put that full armor of God. We're to resist. It means don't come under it. You know, another another way of, 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 of putting resist is, is this. Um, I'll share, I'll share a, a, a short story. Uh, we were having worship practice upstairs, and they, they had a, uh, a woman's uh, meeting downstairs. And somebody came in from off the street. And so one of the ladies yelled upstairs, can, can you come down? There's somebody downstairs, and they want to go upstairs. Uh, this particular person had come before, and we think there might have been some things stolen, but that's beside the point. He wasn't here for anything good. Um, when I came down to talk to him, he got angry with me and started trying to poke me in like this, and he poked my glasses. And then your flesh wants to get all huffy and puffy. I said, help me, Lord. <laughs> all the women are here like this. Oh, I'm watching this guy. And I said, you're going to have to leave. He tried to step around me. I said, you're going to have to leave. He finally looked at me and oh, he stormed off. And he went to the door. And I walked uh, behind him out, out to the door. And he got to the door. And he turned around. He shut that door. And he put both hands on it like this. And he looked at me like, mm -hmm. he tried to open this stinking door. But see, that door at the time swung both ways. So I went, <laughs> And he stood there with his hands like this. <laughs> he shook his head and he just stormed off all mad. It's a long ways to go for the story, but that's what I'm talking about as far as resist. It means to hold, to stand firm, to push against with all your heart so that nobody can come against you, so that no one can come through. And that's what the Word of God is telling us to do. Resist the enemy. Don't be bullied. Don't be pushed to the right or to the left. We do this in the power and strength of Jesus Christ. We don't do it on our own. The battle has been won. We're fighting a toothless lion. God is in control. So it says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Praise God. He will flee from us, from the Holy Spirit within us. So many people you'll hear say about, you know, we've, here I'm talking about casting out demons and doing all these things. And, and I've gone and done. And they're boasting on themselves on how they've come against the devil and they've come into these circumstances. <laughs> Not me. I say, Lord, you go before me. See, we, we have to allow God to do the work. We of ourselves are still worthy of nothing. But God goes before us and we can have confidence and we can have peace. And, and, and what does God tell us to do in the very next verse? He gives us the plan to be restored. Because remember, he's talking about being away from God, about, about being adulterers and adulteresses in the spiritual sense, about looking to the world, about not following what God's calling us to do. So how do we solve this problem? He, he, he tells us in verse 8. Well, even in verse 9 about submitting to God and resisting the devil and he'll flee from us. Verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Well, we know that God is omnipresent. That means God is everywhere. So how do we draw near to God? He's already there. <laughs> we draw near to God in worship. We draw near to God in praise and in prayer and in counsel. We seek his face. We communicate with God. That's how we draw near to God. It's not a matter of uh, proximity because we can be in the same room with somebody even in our own, under our own roof. And if there's rubbings or animosity or problems, you're far from one another. You may be sleeping in the same bed, but you're still far from one another in your hearts because there's a rubbing. But you have to lay those things before God and make sure that you submit them unto the Lord. Because as we draw close to him, the word of God says he will draw close to us. That is so key. People are baffled by the fact they say, I, I want to know God. It just seems like I can't get a hold of God. It's draw close to him. You'll share that with people. Come to the house of God. Come and hear the word of God. Come worship with us. Yeah, well, you know, Sundays is kind of early. 
Well, do you want a relationship with God? Do you want, as you're saying, you need a touch from God? You need help? You need to seek his face? You need a change? More importantly, you need eternal life above all things? But they'll say, ah, it's too much of an inconvenience to draw close to God. But God is calling us, even in our homes, to draw close to him. Even in our workplace, draw close to him. We can be used wherever we're at. He is there. We just have to seek him. It says, draw close to him, and he will draw close to us. It says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Wow, he's, he's not holding anything back on. James is just full swings here at, at the people of God. It says, cleanse your hands. It, it makes me think of, 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 uh, of Pontius Pilate. When Jesus was going to be crucified. And what did he do? He dumped his hands and washed them. And what was he signifying? I have no more dealings with this. I'm done with it. Finished. Whatever you guys do, you do. I'm not a part of it. So the word of God is saying, cleanse your hands, you sinner. Purify your heart, your hearts, you double-minded. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That goes back to, to being the spiritual adultery. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to follow? The Word of God says we can't stand on the fence. We know that even in salvation. We can't say someday I'm going to give my life to the Lord and think that we're okay. Yeah, but I go to church. But being in a building isn't going to save you. It's stepping out and asking Jesus into your heart. Having a relationship with him. Growing closer to him. Allowing him to change you from the inside out. He fills us with that salvation. But it says being double-minded means you could be on both sides of the fence. You know... It says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, and it also says in Hebrews chapter 13, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Do we believe that? In Proverbs chapter 3, is another scripture, and I'll be closing with this. In Proverbs chapter 3 is a scripture that we've all known and read many times. It starts in verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Do we believe the word of God? We're here tonight because we believe the word of God. We're saved tonight, whether you're here or at home, because you believe the word of God. You believe it to be true. You weren't there when Jesus was placed on the cross. But you know by faith that it happened. And the word of God is what opened your heart by the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that if we trust in the Lord with all our heart, that we shouldn't lean on our own understanding, our own thoughts? That's what the Word of God says. Are we willing to acknowledge Him in our ways? Amen. It says He will direct our path. We can't believe half the Scripture and not believe the other half. We can't say, I trust in Him. We say, if you trust in Him, then go forward. Continue to serve Him. Be used by Him. It says, He will direct our paths. He will keep us safe. He will go before us in all we do. Do we believe that? We have to have faith. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil, for it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. See, James said, Are you double minded? Are you believing 
partially what the scripture says? Or are you willing to believe the whole thing? And we'll sit and we'll share these scriptures and people will say amen and they'll go forward 110%. But then when a trial comes, it's not as easy. When you're hearing words from a doctor that can bring fear to your heart, it's not as easy. When you're in a circumstance or a situation that can be life-threatening, it's not as easy. Is it any less true? Is the word of God of less effect because of our circumstance or our situation? Then we must believe it. Or we're being double-minded. Please don't get me wrong. We're all going to fall short of the glory of God. God's not looking for perfection in any one of us, and especially in this direction. But we have to be able to trust his word. And when we trust his word, God goes before us. He will direct our path. Is he going to direct our path in front of a moving bus? If today is the day we go home and be with the Lord, he could. We all have an appointed day. But we know his desires are good, and we have to just trust him in all things. We can share that with a believer, and, and if they're not founded, and if they're shaken, you'll hear, but. I know, but. But it's just hard. I know, but I'm fearful. I know, but it's scary. It is for each and every one of us. And more so for those who are in those other circumstances that I just mentioned. But again, we can't be double-minded. We have to have confidence in Him. We can't have confidence in what's going on beyond that wall. We can't have confidence in, 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 in anything else but in the things of God. And we have to trust in him in all those things. Amen. The last verses in James chapter 4 that we're going to read tonight are. It says in verse 9, which we read, uh, or excuse me, in verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Verse 9 Lament and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Well, that doesn't sound like a good day. But what he's saying is, realize your circumstance. Don't be in a false situation where you think everything is great. We have to really understand where we stand with God. And if it takes a shaking to cause us to, to, to be broken because we're allowing sin to come in and be a part of our life, whether we're not drawing close to God, whether we're not praying in the right manner, whatever the circumstance is, allow it to break our hearts. Allow it to just move us from within so that there is a change within us. And verse 10 gives us the final stamp on it. It says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will lift us up. We serve a God who is able to lift us up. Trust in Him. Trust in Him in all things. James wrote this to the church in general. I share this with you in the same manner. So this isn't a this isn't a specific word that God is giving to the Rock Church. I, I'm not trying to 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 beat anybody down. I'm just trying to get our mind and heart set upon him. Because we will have his peace if we do that. If we're in a circumstance where we're making decisions on our own, we will have no peace. Whether you're here or you're at home, seek God in your circumstance and see if you have his peace. If you are filled with his peace, praise God. If you're not, it's time to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. He will lift us up. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to stand and, and we're going to pray. I'm going to call the musicians forward. And we're going to pray. And after I pray, if there's anyone that needs prayer tonight, uh, you can just raise your hand and, and some of us will go to you. So we definitely want to always give opportunity for anyone that wants personal prayer.
But right now, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And as the musicians come, we're going to, we're going to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for it is true, Lord. Father, we thank you for the strength, Father, that only you can bring. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, where we feel weak, Lord, where we have fear, where we have worry, Lord. Father, you drive these out in Jesus' name. Father, you help us to resist the devil, Lord. Resist the, the, the enemy as he tries to move us to the right and to the left. Father, you, you help us to stand upon your word. Father, knowing that you will go before us in our hands. Father, we are so small and weak, Lord. But you are so big. And Father, you fight for us. You go before us in all things. Father, tonight we humble ourselves before you. Asking for your will to be done in each one of our lives, Lord. Father, whether in this building or whether at home, Father, you move in a mighty way in each heart that is represented here tonight. We thank you, Father, for the loving gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for filling us with your joy and peace that surpasses all understanding. And we ask, Lord, that you continue, even in these days, to keep our mind and heart set upon you. That we would be filled with your peace and with your joy. And with that you are greater than all these things. Bless your people tonight. Strengthen them. Fill them with your joy, Lord, tonight. For you are greater. Father, even today in our lives and even yesterday. And Father, you even have much more for us even tomorrow. Have your way. We give you all thanks. All honor and all praise, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. If anyone desires prayer right now, you just go ahead and raise your hand and someone will go to you and pray. Praise God. If not, we can just worship God when we stand.